Legal professionals. What's the funniest way you've ever seen a lawyer or defendant blow a court case? I'm a bankruptcy paralegal. I used to work for a Chapter 13 trustee who told me this story. A debtor who had filed a Chapter 7 bankruptcy was going through the normal questions at his 341 meeting. This meeting is a hearing without a judge, where the trustee asks a debtor simple questions regarding their situation and the paperwork they've filed. Creditors may also question the debtor, but other than the IRS, none ever show up. And when I was there, the IRS representative always fell asleep and I'd have to wake her up when one of the cases she was there for was called. For the most part, it takes no more than five minutes per case. The hearing basically exists for the debtor to affirm under oath that, to the best of their knowledge, their paperwork is complete and accurate, and for the trustee to address any issues he has with the case before the case is confirmed and allowed to take its natural course. With few exceptions, an attorney has done all their paperwork for them and is with them, representing them at this hearing. It's all very straightforward and a non-event for the most part, one document that the debtors have to provide lists all their personal property. Another document they provide is used to protect the property. As in bankruptcy, you're still allowed to keep your stuff, your car, and your house, provided the value of these things is within certain limits or meets various criteria. Most people don't have to give up any property at all. However, in Chapter 7, a trustee can seize any of your property that is not protected. This would be a property that is worth more than the values that are allowed or that is not protected by other factors, such as being exempt from seizure for various reasons provided by the law. The trustee can also seize property if it could be protected, but the debtor has failed to fill out the correct paperwork to create that protection. I'm oversimplifying, but that's the gist of it. But again, very few people lose anything at all. Anyway, in his paperwork, the debtor in this story failed to disclose one item in particular, and also failed to include it in the paperwork that would have protected it. And that is why he was forced to remove the Rolex from his wrist and hand it over to the trustee, right then and there. Story 2. A judge I worked for once oversaw a trial where a woman claimed to have been so badly maimed by a surgery that she could not bear to go out in public. The case had been going on for three years to get to trial. In cross-examination, the defense attorney for the woman's doctor spent two hours reading every one of the woman's tweets since the surgery allowed. He brought in blown-up pictures of the woman's posts, of her in a two-piece in Aruba and out at the bars for her ladies' night in mini skirts and low-cut shirts. On a break, the woman ran out of the courtroom crying. Twenty minutes later, her lawyer came back in and informed the judge she was dropping the case. On a related topic, here's another one. My brother was on a jury back in the days of MySpace. A woman had been hit by a big rig during foggy weather. She was suing for a back injury. On the last day of the trial, they asked her if she had MySpace account and brought up her site for the jury to see. I think all profiles were open then. There's a picture of her dancing in the hood of a car and right next to it is a text exchange of her saying that she shouldn't go out too much because her lawyer says that she has to look injured. Needless to say, she lost that case. Story 3 not me, not a legal professional, but my brother's EMT instructor used to live in Chicago. This one's a 2-4. The instructor himself had his license suspended for numerous traffic charges, including evading police, but I forgot about his arrangement date until about an hour prior. So the guy hops on a motorcycle and drives himself to the court. Remember this for later. The dude in the court right before him is a Hispanic guy. The judge reads off everything he's charged with, and then the conversation goes like this. Judge. Mr. Gonzalez, how do you plead? Gonzalez. No hablo inglés. Judge. Mr. Gonzalez, do you understand a word I'm saying? Gonzalez. No hablo inglés. Judge. Mr. Gonzalez, am I to understand that this whole time no one has bothered to get a translator for you? Gonzalez. No hablo inglés. Judge. Well, I guess if you can't understand what you're charged with, we'll have to drop all the charges. Gonzalez. Gracias, señor. Starts walking out. Judge. Get back in here. After him, the instructor goes up, the judge reads his charges, and then asks him how he got to the court that day. Instructor. Oh, my brother gave me a ride. Judge. Is that right? Instructor. Yes, your honor. Judge, looking at the bailiff. Do you have that footage from parking deck three? He then proceeds to play CCTV footage of him showing up on the exact same bike that he had been using when he ran from the cops. His license remained suspended and the judge told him he couldn't go anywhere near the bike during that time. There was even a cop standing next to it when he left. Sounds like the No Hablo Inglés bit is a spin-off from a Bowling for Soup song. Look it up. Thank me later. Story 4. I saw the cops blow it once. A high school friend got a speeding ticket and he ended up in court defending himself and questioning the cop. He started by asking where the cop was situated when he clocked him. The cop answered that he was sitting under an underpass. My friend continued, Would you say it was dangerous to speed in that situation? To which the cop replied, Yes, traffic was heavy. Do you remember me saying at the stop there was another vehicle of the same make and model and close in color as mine? My friend asked. The cop answered, yes. To which my friend responded, how can you be sure you pulled over the right one? Between clocking the vehicle and pulling it over, I never took my eyes off it. The cop answered. At this point, my friend said, 
After the stop, if I had pulled quickly onto the highway from the shoulder without looking at traffic in the rightmost lane I was entering, would you say that was dangerous and something you might pull me over for again? The cop is like, uh, yeah. If I saw you do that, it would be unsafe and I'd pull you over again and give you another ticket. Are you admitting that's what you did? The rest of the questioning went on like this. Friend, are you testifying that you would never pull out onto traffic without checking the rightmost lane you were merging into? Cop, yes, I wouldn't do that. Friend, so it's safe to say that when you pulled out to chase me, you definitely did so safely. You already said the traffic was dense, so are you sure you didn't just fly out into traffic and possibly almost hit someone? Cop, smugly. Uh, no. I'm quite sure I didn't almost hit someone or pull out in a dangerous fashion. What does this have to do with anything? Friend, well, you said earlier that you never took your eyes off the vehicle you clocked. Now you're saying that you entered the roadway safely because you checked the lane you were merging into. Can you please explain how it is that you managed to keep your eyes on a speeding vehicle in dense traffic retreating from you at a high rate of speed, looked in your side mirror and rear view or over your shoulder and merged safely? Cop. I, uh, I mean, it's possible. He just kind of looked pleadingly at the DA at this point. The judge had had enough, framed my friend, but dismissed the ticket. Well, that's about the coolest thing I've ever read about somebody defending themselves in court. Story 5. I'm not a legal professional, but I do have a good story on this topic. Fifteen or so years ago, my dad was the manager of a small hotel. One of the semi-regular customers was this big Samoan dude, who booked in for a day at a time. Always had a few visitors and always paid in cash in a one-to-one -one conversation with American dollars. Highly unusual in Australia. Dad always said he was a great customer, very friendly with the staff, never gave anyone any problems, and always had a bit of a chat when he checked in. One day, a couple of detectives rolled up and asked to speak to my dad. They showed him a photo of the aforementioned customer and asked if he was currently staying in the hotel. Dad confirmed that he was, and in a matter of minutes, a small contingent of cops arrived, stormed the room, and escorted the guy away in handcuffs. It turns out the guy was a pretty major dealer and was wanted in a couple of states. Cut to the court date quite some time later. My dad is on the witness stand and, for whatever reason, the defense is trying to make it sound like my dad didn't know the defendant and had never seen him before. Obviously, my dad insisted that he did in fact know the defendant, but that line persisted in the defense. As my dad left the witness box, he walked past the defendant and said, Hi, Barry. To which Barry enthusiastically replied, Hi, Jason. How are you? Well, I'm sure this wasn't the only thing that counted against him in the case. It certainly couldn't have helped. He ended up spending quite a few years in jail. Story 6. A funny historical one here. Marshal Ney is on trial for treason after Napoleon was overthrown for the second time. His lawyer desperately tries to save the marshal's life with an unusual take on things. Due to a border change, Marshal Ney's hometown was, at the time of the trial, in Prussia. Therefore, argued the lawyer, Marshal Ney was not technically French and, accordingly, could not be guilty of treason. Marshal Ney disagreed and shouted out to the court, I am French and I will remain French. He was subsequently found guilty and sentenced to death. This also had a double whammy with epic last words. He asked for and was given permission to lead his own firing squad. His last words to them were, Soldiers, when I give the command to fire, fire straight in my heart. Wait for the order. It will be my last to you. I protest against my condemnation. I have fought a hundred battles for France and not one against her. Soldiers, fire. Talk about a way to die. Marshal Ney will forever be immortalized in the halls of greatness. Say what you will about the French, but they have a long history of military conquest and legendary people like this. Story 7 my father is an attorney, and he always had a story for us when we'd ask him this question. He tells it way better than I do, but I'll give it a shot. Some dude was allegedly smashing a wall with a sledgehammer with others in order to break into private property. The cops rolled up, and he was the only one to get caught. Fast forward a few months, and this guy's in court. Apparently, a cop says something about how the defendant was the only one caught, but there were two other men who fled on foot and couldn't be apprehended. My father's client's face lights up in an aha moment and immediately tells the judge, Not true. There were four of us. I guess he thought if he could disprove someone, he would be let go. It is safe to say that he was found guilty of vandalism. My father says the judge just kind of sighed and told my father it would be a good idea to keep his client quiet. Story 8 I worked as a paralegal at a firm specializing in land use litigation and real estate. Another paralegal's husband got a DUI, driving while intoxicated, and as a favor to her, one of the partners offered to defend her husband in court. This is a small town with a landmark windmill in the center of town. Well, this paralegal's husband, who we all called the missing link, DUI stemmed from his crashing his car into the windmill. Front page of the local paper, reporters at the arrangement, the whole nine yards. So the law firm partner tells the missing link that when the judge asks him how many drinks he had before his accident, he should tell her he had three. He proceeds to stand in front of the judge and tell her he had three cases. The whole room started laughing and he ended up getting jail time. <laughs> to be fair, he did have three drinks at the beginning of those three cases. Story 9. I was still in law school, working as a solo practitioner part-time, 
We had this divorce where the dude got caught cheating and his wife cleaned out the bank account, which was the only marital asset, to pay for her attorney's fees. There was absolutely no reason for her to pay that much for an attorney, and due to that, the attorney on the other side was inflaming her client to fight on every little issue to earn that retainer. Now, our dude was also stupid. He didn't pay the court-ordered temporary child support order, and due to that, he had to pay some of her attorney's fees. But after all that is dealt with, we have a date to hear arguments on anything not agreed to. Her biggest point is that he'll pay the support order, but she owes him half the bank account amount. We got in front of the judge, and she tried to argue that she used the money to pay for a new place and moving fees. B.S. We had the financial statement where the wife stated she paid pretty much the whole amount as a retainer. The judge turns around, looks at the attorney in the face, and tells her that her signature is on the financial statement, meaning that either she lied in the statement or she's lying right now. The judge tells her to think very carefully about her next statement and that, in her opinion, the wife needs to pay half the money back. The other attorney goes quiet, asks for a recess, and completely changes her resolution position. He basically had her because she knew if he wanted to, this could amount to a bar complaint. She made a false statement to the tribunal. We got him all his money back and he got to claim his child for the next five years and his taxes. I honestly feel bad for the wife. She had no clue how badly her attorney was screwing her over. This, among other things, is why I refuse to practice family law. Story 10. I'm not a legal professional, but I found it necessary to represent myself in a custody matter involving my daughter, who was being physically harmed by her mother. My daughter came to live with me, and the day she arrived, she had a bruise on the side of her face. Reported to the police and CAS with no results. Skip ahead to almost two years of making myself knowledgeable in court procedures and self-representation, and I knew that regardless of the issues, my ex could never resist the need to correct me. Appearing in front of the superior court justice with my ex and her lawyer, the justice asked what this was about my ex hurting my daughter. Informed him of the bruise on her face and my daughter told me her mom slapped her. My ex went into a rage, yelling that she would never hit her daughter and that I was making this up to paint her as a bad mother. I looked at my ex and said, Our daughter told me what she did off of the liquor cabinet. Without missing a beat, my ex said it wasn't the liquor cabinet, it was the refrigerator. Her lawyer did a face palm and the court justice winked at me as he put it over for a final hearing to award me custody. Sweet justice. Story 11. Obligatory, not a lawyer, but I took a class in constitutional rights where we had to read decisions from my country's Supreme Court. There was this one where a woman was suing her employer, a company because IT had found private images of the woman in the company's computer. IT gave the tip to HR who proceeded to contact the company's legal department. Anyhow, the woman was fired and she sued because she claimed that by showing the pictures to the lawyer, the company was going against her right to privacy. HR also threatened to release the pics to the other employees if the woman kept suing or something like that. In the end, the court decided that HR had to return the pictures to the woman and that was it. The funny thing was that the woman claimed that those pictures weren't dirty, even though she was in her birthday suit and in suggestive poses. She claimed that she had arrived tired from work, passed out in her bed, and her daughter took those pics. Story 12 I saw a lawyer schedule a preliminary trial on a non-criminal court day. These days were reserved for family or traffic. The lawyer insisted that by not doing so it was a violation of his client's right to a speedy trial. He was in custody at jail and needed to be transported about two hours out of town for this court case. The judge knew the lawyer would be late. He was always late. So when the inmate arrived at the court on the scheduled non-criminal court day, the lawyer was, you guessed it, late. Once the defendant was in process to the courtroom, the judge immediately told the clerics not to call the lawyer's office, and he started looking at his watch. After about 10 minutes, the judge called in and we out-processed the prisoner to the transport vehicle. By the time the prisoner was moving off the property, the lawyer had pulled into the parking lot. There was a closed-door session between the judge and lawyer. To be a fly on the wall for that conversation. Story 13. I went to court with a friend who was really nervous and just needed someone to sit with him. The illegal substance court was very interesting. One girl was there with her mom, who kept trying to speak for her. The judge would ask a question and the mom would answer. The judge would remind the mother that her daughter was of legal age and could speak for herself. The mom would not listen and was pissing the judge off. The mom even started getting an attitude with the judge and started saying, She's a child. She's scared. The judge was like, Ma'am, she's an adult. She's not a child anymore. He finally threatened her with a contempt of court and that got her to be quiet. The girl ended up getting a slightly harsher punishment than the other people pleading with youthful offenders, and I definitely think her mom helped with that. Instead of having a substance screening once a month, which costs $50, she was put in a color code. This seemed to make the mom mad, who tried to say something again, but this time the daughter elbowed her. Story 14 I was a divorce attorney in Los Angeles for 16 years before I moved to Phoenix and started my own private practice. Years ago in California, I had a client who was being divorced by her husband. She was a smoking hot woman in her 20s. He claimed she was being unfaithful, so he divorced her, but he didn't have any evidence, so I thought we had a pretty solid case, and my client would get a decent share of his fortune, who worked in oil and gas and was worth millions. During the trial, one of the bailiffs recognized my client and told the judge, this is where things got bad for us. 
It turns out, my client was doing adult content in the San Fernando Valley while she was married to her husband, and the bailiff embarrassingly recognized her from one of her videos online. The judge reviewed the evidence in private in her chamber with me and his lawyer and awarded my client nothing. Story 15 I spent two days in jail many moons ago. They ended up in the felony section. That was fun. Anyhow, I met some pretty interesting characters. One such gentleman, I can't remember his name, let's call him Bob. There were about four of us in a cell and we were just shooting topics and discussing why everyone was in there. Bob is back in jail. He's borderline <laughs> Before this current situation, he was facing two felonies for, I don't remember. His lawyer eventually convinces the court that he can't stand trial because he's not mentally competent. They eventually let him go. What's the first thing he decides to do once he gets out of jail? Try to steal the first car he sees, in front of the courthouse, which is adjacent to the jail. It didn't cross his mind the cops would be in and out of that area all the time. He was back in jail probably 20 to 30 minutes after he got out, after beating two felonies. Story 16 I was an expert engineer witness at a deposition defending a contractor who happened to be an engineer himself. The plaintiff claimed he was liable as an engineer as well as a contractor. The defense was that he was the contractor, but that doesn't mean he was the engineer for the project just because he was one. After six hours of headache-inducing questioning, the plaintiff's lawyer pulled out a letter from and certified by the contractor that simply stated, I am the engineer for the project. He sits back and basically has that look of, let's see what you have to say now. Spent six horrific hours and something a simple letter could finish, but hey, that's just a normal day in a courtroom. If you had fun with these occupational disasters, there's more over in my other video. People who lost their job because of a social media post. What happened? Story 1 is basically a wake-up call. See you there.